Recently on Disciples of the Eight, the party got some rest after receiving a startling update from Jinnabon about the next step of their journey, as well as some things that have changed along the way. The next morning, Artemis, Icky, and Wall stayed behind in the tower to work on their own personal projects, while everyone else set about on a shopping trip to gather some cold weather gear in preparation for a journey farther north. Eventually, they found themselves in the Dragon's Fall, speaking to the Moon Elf proprietor about procuring some white dragon scales for Eki's project. Okay, so you guys notice that he is... What, you hear this conversation go on briefly as soon as AD gets done telling you guys about the kids outside. You guys notice that he just kind of goes stonewall for a second, and his eyes go completely flat. He takes a quick breath... Vicros and AD, you notice a small amount of frost come out as he exhales. Uh-huh. I would really like to not be in a fight. In common, he responds to Magdar with, you come to my shop and threaten me? And I suppose that I, because I rolled bad, I'm just, a, like, I'm over here whistling Dixie totally. Yeah, you, you're like, why is he mad? I just said that I'm with these people, and he better not be trying to mess with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to grab Magdar's shoulder and pull him back and be like, no, no, he doesn't get out often. Don't know what's happening. Don't want to be angry. We'll bring you the artist. We do apologize for our friend. He's really not used to being around people, and he needs to learn to hold his tongue. As you say, he doesn't get out more. You kind of see him. He shakes his head and he goes, I should know that one who had heard the call would still be not quite fully adapted to the world that we reside in. Apologies, follower of the blood. And he bows to Magdar. I'll just do the same. Had no idea that I was stepping over a line, man. He looks at the group and he goes, why don't you all join me? Bring the artist back. Let's have a discussion. Meet on more agreeable terms. Let bygones be bygones. We'll see what we can't do for one another. Very well. Apologies, we didn't even in- introduce ourselves. I'm Vikros. The Pantsless. The Pantsless. <laughs> <laughs> and at that, he kind of cocks an eyebrow. <laughs> oh, I was hoping you heard it. Does he check to see if he has pants on? Yes, he most definitely, <laughs> very, like, not even discreetly, he just looks down and looks back up and cocks his head, nods. There's a long story behind that. I'm Merome. Everyone just looks at the druid. Oh, I'm ready to get out of here. My, my business is done. I'll bring the artist back later. <laughs> he smiles a little bit at that. One of these days we'll learn your name. Yeah! It's only been a year. And sir, what can we call you? He looks at Magdar in particular. And he ponders for a moment. And he goes, you may call me acquaintance for now. Should we decide on friend later, that is when we will make the decision. Very well, Mr. Acquaintance. We'll be back with our friend. He bows. And when can I expect you? Uh, We haven't got much going on for the rest of the day. I suppose it's up to him. Excellent. Well, tell you what. Send a runner, new in town, obvious adventurer... Are you staying in the tower, or are you staying with the guards? I'll be staying in the tower. Staying in the tower. Send a runner to me. Let them tell me when to expect you, and I will lay on a fine meal, and perhaps have a few friends over. Sounds great. Will do. Sounds wonderful. I think that Druid's like halfway across town, but now we should probably catch up with her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yep, here we go. He nods as you guys leave the shop. You guys kind of get out of the alley, and it is noticeably much colder than when you first went into the shop. And it is large, large snowflakes falling. Are there people around on the street? There are still people around. It looks like it's just recently started to snow. There's already a fairly decent dusting. Go ahead, and since she pointed out the group of children, everybody give me a perception check on seeing the children. I love these dice, except for when I don't. <laughs> okay, so Vikros and Arame, do you see some kids, but nobody really matches the kind of group mentality that you were told about in the shop? Magdar and AD, you guys don't really notice anything. Uh, it is just, as far as you guys are concerned, it is snowing its tits off all of a sudden, and it's time to not be there. 
Yeah, it's it's yeah. very cold, and I need to go get Iggy. And Romeo's just saying, like, what is this? This is weird. Uh, Rome, on the way through the Unicorn Ward, you did see a Temple of Helm, and it is kind of, like, right on the way, so if you wanted to stop and just have them pick you up, uh, they will walk right back past it. Yeah, she's, she's going to be like, I'm going to be in here. Come collect me whenever we're ready to go meet our new acquaintance. Very well. It's been a long time since I've been able to visit the temple. Cool. Bye. Cool. Three men, penguin bottle, all the way back. <laughs> Yeah, and she just ducks down and goes up to the temple and whatever sort of common way of entering is. I think Main Street of like a small southern town where you've got the Baptist Church next to the Methodist Church next to the First United. Like they're just mm-hmm. kind of all in a row there. So you're able to just kind of walk up, say a quick prayer as you walk in. And once you flash your symbol, which is only you know allotted to the a certified paladin or cleric of Helm, you're able to either take a small monk's room for quiet time, or you can stay in the kind of central area uh, for more social prayer. It's up to you. I think just because, like, she's had a lot of quiet time prayer, I imagine it's been a really long time since she's been able to, like, talk to another paladin or cleric. Okay. Her face. She's going to try and find a social place, and I think she will sort of pull her cowl down and push her hood back. Yeah, so again, there, there's no Dark Elves here, but no one bats an eye at you being there. The kind of main look is more at your weaponry. You notice that uh, no one really seems to be armed in the city. She would have left most of her weapons behind. Like, she might have still have her daggers, but I don't think she's been walking around the city fully armed. Gotcha. Even that kind of draws a couple of glances. No one says anything. I mean, from your attire, it's obvious you're an adventurer, so a little more leeway is given. You live a life kind of rife with peril and danger at every turn. And that's just kind of true of anyone who doesn't make a home in the cities. So you're able to kind of strike up just mutual conversation with anybody, kind of get the leanings of the church, kind of how things are going. You know, what you're getting is more and more of the kind of standard array of temples are closing in the mainland. It's getting more and more of a monotheism with the high king as the subject. And she might ask for information on the temple that she was a part of, which I imagine it's like it's somewhere kind of sort of far off. As most priests would do, they'll know where most of their temples are still at. Uh, the name is familiar, but no one knows anything off the top of their head. That's understandable, but she just had to ask. Yeah, and, uh, pretty much it takes a little bit of asking around. You know, people are kind of coming in and out of the room talking to other people. Basically, the consensus is it's pretty confident it's still open, but with most of the other temples to most of the pantheon on the mainland at least uh the temples are slowly shutting down so it's probably only a matter of time okay so while she is doing her thing and you know doing her hail marys and whatnots you guys just heading back to tower to grab Aki and roll back out or what are you doing uh yes well i think first we have to check where Aki is at in his process because we may not be able to walk away yeah so at, at very least we'll start with that we'll make our way to Aki's room if we can Maybe pop over Linguini's room, make sure he doesn't have two black eyes. <laughs> Let me check and see if there's a sock on the door. Yeah. <laughs> the one black eye would be from Michaela. Oh. <laughs> okay, so Icky, I'll let you answer all those questions to where you are, sir. I'm still in my room. Oh, Icky, we, we've returned. <laughs> Thanks. We didn't get the things, but we found a cellar. It was a little weird, so... He had nine pretty big ones. He, like, puts down his tools when you say nine. He kind of slowly turns to you, like, go on. Yes, yes. <laughs> Quite big. For uh, what seemed to be a reasonable price, 2,400 gold. But at the mere thought of someone buying these and using them, he was a little concerned. He wanted to make sure it was being used for not evil. So he wanted to meet you to... See what you were making. Fine, as long as he gets his skills. Who went to go check on Linguini? Yo. So you knock on the door. There's no response. You can check the knob. The knob's not locked. As you walk in, uh, Linguini's just kind of sitting on the bed. Doesn't appear to be any roughness or anything about that, but uh, he's just kind of wide-eyed looking around. He doesn't look scared or anything. He looks more kind of apprehensive. Uh, I'm going to stay in the doorway and ask what happened. Um, uh, 
So sometimes when when a when a boy really likes a girl, they do things. Uh huh. I don't know if I want to marry her, but he he said that if if we did it again and, and I didn't make her an honest woman, he would end quote. Um, I need to look it up because he said it hurt a lot. Um, a uh, blood eagle me. Ooh, ow. Right, so you basically have two options at this point. One is much easier than the other. Either don't leave any evidence behind, or go have a conversation with that girl right now. (laughs) And he just... Well, he said I could go to the library, and for for the first time, Linguini doesn't have that real thick accent. You think it's just brought on by sheer terror. But, um... When I asked the librarian for a picture of it, he sent me away. Yeah. Same two answers. Okay. Do you know where she is? No. Alright. Let's go look. <laughs> he very slowly gets off the bed and follows you. He just kind of goes to the door that she walked out of with Mike that morning and taps. And she throws the door open and she just looks at him puts her hands on her hips. She goes, you are not going to let him tell you how to live your life, are you? He's scary. <laughs> <laughs> and at that, Tim walks out from behind Michaela, and he shushes her, and he grabs him, and he walks down the hallway in conversation with Linguini. Okay. Everyone's talking. Everyone seems relatively calm. I'm going to wait for, like, three minutes, and if I don't hear any blood-curdling screams, I'm probably going to go fuck off to a warm blanket. That's cute. You think there would be screams if Tim did, if Tim was killing him. <laughs> you hear, kind of, as they get out of range of just kind of the quiet talk, they're not whispering, they're just not talking loudly, they're having a standard conversation. You, you hear Linguini go, well, why would you use a sheepskin? And just continue the conversation down the hallway. <laughs> All right, somebody's having a practical talk with this plan. <laughs> you see, Michaela just turns scarlet and look at you with just horror in her eyes and squeak as she <laughs> and closes the door. <laughs> All right then. My dad had one talk with him. Now my uncle's having a completely other talk, and I don't know which is more horrifying. <laughs> so yeah, uh, you guys just kind of do whatever. Don't forget, he did ask for a runner, so we can make sure that he had everything prepped for you guys. Uh huh. So once you guys get a plan out, I would highly recommend that. I, I would like to ask Icky if he's ready to go now, or if he's in the middle of the process that needs to wait. Or I'll be the runner. I'll leave out before everybody. No, we can send a runner who knows the city. I'm sure the tower has a couple around. Oh, we don't. Oh, okay. I figured I'd be able to find my way back. But yeah, that's cool too. All right, well, you guys are figuring that out. I'm going to take a quick five-minute bio break and be right back. That's fun. Just how many people very much want us dead and how powerful some of them are. Yeah, seem pretty standard. Pretty standard. I mean, up. we're doing something right, I think. Maybe. We're definitely spreading the word of the eight, and that is great. Everyone yeah. else can suck it. Well, maybe they can do more than help can. Rabbi's like, hey, I got a backup plan if help can't help. I, I was so happy Jenabon came back. I put little sparkles around his name in my notepad. Highest honor one can receive. Truly is. I, I thought it was the if you also do the, the dot the eye with the heart. No, no. The true measure is glitter. If I owned glitter right now, would I use it? <laughs> it's everywhere. That's why it's top tier. Top tier only. Yeah, having a pantheon as friends is definitely going to prove helpful. It already has, because I think that's the only reason it's produced his daughter has not murdered us already. Yeah, or it could be a huge pain in the ass later, too. You know, like, we run into some zealots that are very much one god. Or apparently the people that worship the king. Well, they wouldn't have a problem with the eight. I would like to let you guys know that I am incredibly disappointed you rolled a ten on that roll. <laughs> oh. A ten on which roll? <laughs> 
to get to the Dragon's Fall. Oh, you wanted us to poke around a bit? I wanted you guys to go to Ginny's Juju Joint first. <laughs> what would ha- what would have happened if we just said out instead of front door? You were very upset by that. You know what? We still have the opportunity of somebody saying it, so I'm not going to ruin my fun. <laughs> I have my sweets. DMs, we got to have fun somehow, and it's leaving players completely unsuspecting and watching them walk into this stuff, and then just laughing as everything goes to hell around them. Being a wizard, wizard of acid, it's a uh, wizard joke. A little wizard joke for you. A wizard joke's the equivalent of dad puns. <laughs> if dad puns were significantly more dangerous. Yes. So yeah, Icky shoves an object into Wall's backplate holding area and shoves all his tools very haphazardly into his toolkit. Everyone watching that had some sort of OCD would cringe at the sight. And then he shoves that into his bag of holding and slings that over his back and kind of pops up and looks at Victor's expectantly. Oh, here, your money back. Oh, yes. And I'll take that and shove that in there as well. As I'm like shoving it in, like the the purse itself kind of opens up. You hear like clinging as it spills into the bag of holding. (laughs) (laughs) Well, before we go, we were requested to send a runner. I don't know who we ought to ask, but... It didn't really explain how to do most things to us. I would imagine we just grab somebody from the tower and go, Hey, we need to send a runner to this shop. What shop? To Dragon's Reach. Uh, um, that's a little far. Well, let's try the Fallen Dragon. <laughs> what? The name of the shop is Fallen Dragon? <laughs> is it? <laughs> sure. Dragon's Fall. Uh, yeah, it, it gets a little mixed up. Yeah, Dragon's Fall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Man, I'm better with maps than Nate. Romeo's not there, so... Icky will close the door in Vicaros's face and then say, Dragon's Fall, and then open the door and step through it. <laughs> you take a couple of steps, and you notice that while you're not in your room anymore, you are falling briefly, and then suddenly you are on a massive slide that started almost at the top of the tower, and it deposits you after about 20 seconds of terror at the front door. I don't know about terror... Well, however you would react to suddenly falling about 15 feet and then landing on a slide that appears to be completely invisible and then rocketing down to the front door. Absolute joy and <laughs> maniacal laughter. Minor P. <laughs> I told you guys. Wizard joke. Yep. <laughs> Vicros, you see Icky just close the door in your face and then you don't really hear anything for a few seconds. And then Wall kind of opens the door and just says, uh, he's gone. Oh, well, I did hear him say Dragon Fall. I wonder if he got teleported there. Oh, shit. We were told to send a runner. Oh. <laughs> I don't know that I'm actually there because I'm off with Linguini. Although I would have been wandering back. Well, then you said you were going to go find a blanket. Uh, you're probably laying down somewhere. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Uh, the dog somehow got out front and was playing with the neighbor's dog. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was just explaining to him how... Icky slammed the door in his face, and he didn't really hear anything. And then a few seconds later, Wall kind of opened the door and was like, uh, he's gone. <laughs> well, Wall, well, come on, let's go find him. Are you guys going to try to round up Artemis, or are you just going to let him do his thing? Uh, he did say to bring everyone. I guess I have no fucking clue where Artemis is. There's still something you can try. There is something I, I would like to try. <laughs> well, I'll meet you at the front door. And then I'll call out Artemis, and I will try to take a couple steps in port. Okay, and you wind up in a very 1850s idea of a mad scientist lab. There's giant lightning coils piled into a corner, beakers of all sorts, and you see Artemis and a another man who you presume to be a wizard wearing a white lab coat. Looks rather disheveled, and they are f- speaking a language that you understand, but the words are just absolutely asinine to you. They mean nothing. Uh, aha. Uh-huh. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Sorry to interrupt. Hello. Artemis, uh, if you're not too terribly busy, we did pick you up some winter clothes and uh, some winter gear, but 
that's not the point. That's not why I'm here. Uh, we're, we're going to go uh, uh, perhaps have some uh, dinner with a new friend. Would you care to join us? Or I see you guys look a little busy. I suppose I've been working quite hard all day. This uh, might be good to step away from you. I'll be back later. We'll see you then. Either way. I, I suppose I ought to round up the others. I, I, I'll meet you at the front. Wall will be there. Uh, we got to find a key. All right, try. Right. How do I get to the entrance? Anything specific? I turn to. He said you could say one of two things: front door or out. Ah, okay. Ooh, out sounds fun. Let's try that. Uh, out. Oh no. <laughs> you take a couple of steps, and as you do, you're suddenly transported outside. You, in a brief glance around, you're able to see that you're actually higher than the tower. You fall for about 15 feet, and you're caught by an invisible slide oh, yeah. that just twists and turns and careens until it deposits you right in front of the door, and you see a very happy Icky jumping up and down as you do so. That was fun, right? But imagine... For at least the first few seconds, as I, as I start falling, there's a moment of terror, and then I realize this is definitely something interesting. So as soon as I saw that, I'm pretty happy going down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. Let's do it again. <laughs> oh, I believe we have so much to meet, guys. Having a little bit of success trying that last time, I was like, all right, I gotta go run up Magdar. I gotta run up the girls. Romy's not in the building. Oh, that's right. You're, you're at Helm Temple. Mm. Well, I gotta get... Um, fuck, I don't know her name. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll start with my room. So I'll say room and port to my room. You're warped straight to your room, no issues. Right, okay. No sass. I, I think internally, I gotta figure out that little elf chick's name. I, this is not working out very well. I'll go knock <laughs> on her door. Did you ever go back into your room, or were you just watching the shenanigans unfold? Yeah, I uh, I watched that, and then uh, once Michaela squeaked and shut her door, I wandered off to my room because I didn't know how much time Icky was going to take. Uh, it, it, so it's actually all kind of transpired rather quickly, just everybody was doing kind of their own thing. So about the time that Icky vanished and Wall stepped out into the hallway would be about the time that she squeaked and closed the door. Yeah, so running into Vicaros on the way to my room or whatever the timing for that would be. Yeah, it'd be about the time you got to your door, he'd be walking out of his. Yeah, so then I'll tag along with the group back to the shop. Okay. Magdar, what are you up to, sir? Were you just kind of hanging out in the hallway waiting for everything to get together? I'm just going with the group. We're heading off to go talk to okay. the group, right? You're able to kind of gather everybody up. How do you guys exit? Front door. Very carefully. <laughs> Is everybody's front door next? Front door. Uh, as you guys say that, uh, you step out in the middle of a very and passion conversation about how that was the, one of the coolest things that's ever happened between Icky and Artemis. We really shall have to go again. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, hello, everybody. On our way to uh, the, fu- I mean, the Dragon's Fall, we ought to stop by uh, Hel- Helm's Temple to pick up Arome, though. She did say to get her on the way back. Yeah, that's about halfway there, so it'll take you guys about 30 minutes to get there. We'll say you, you guys will walk a little bit slower to let the runner have time to actually give the heads up that you're on the way. So we'll say that you guys kind of drag your feet a little bit. It takes about 45 minutes to get to Helm's Temple. If everyone would give me a perception check on the way to the temple. It is also, if anything, snowing maybe a little harder, but it doesn't really seem to be a big change. Rama is just having a lovely conversation. Just like, she's like, I've missed these debates. (laughs) Yeah, with that, you guys don't really see anything. Uh, The streets are pretty empty as of right now. It's getting on. It's a little bit past midday. It's probably about one o'clock in the afternoon. And it is noticeably colder now than it was this morning. And instead of a light dusting, uh, you're walking across about an inch or two of snow. Which I am, as having seen it the first time in my life just now, completely horrified. (laughs) At this frozen hell that you (laughs) find yourself? (laughs) Not just at the snow, but everyone else's lack of alarm that it is actually doomsday right now and everybody's (laughs) just walking around talking (laughs) and buying fur and stuff. So you guys uh, get to Temple. Uh, Rave, how much do they have any difficulty extracting you from your theological debates, ma'am? I, she is going to be a little reluctant to leave because she's in this, but she's like, oh, we'll return to this conversation later, I'm afraid. My friends and I have a prior meeting, and they kind of tend to get into trouble when I'm not there. 
But that was, that was good to meet you all. A very plump, elderly priestess walks over and she... Remember, hot luck will be on the second Wednesday. Don't forget <laughs> to bring brownies. And she pats you on the knee as she walks away. Oh, places like this. Also, this is <laughs> probably the first time you'll have ever seen her around, like, strangers with, like, the face cover. I'm just like, now's oh, the time to leave. Yes, ma'am. We're on the way. All right. She pulls up the scarf and puts her hood up. I was not that much colder up. She, and she steps outside. Oh, it's so cold. <laughs> so, so miserable. <laughs> So yeah, if you guys continue with the kind of the slower pace that you took to get there, it'll take you guys about another 45 minutes, maybe 50 tops to get to the uh, Dragon's Fall. A couple of twists and turns, you get a little backed up, you, know, you find some place called the Falling Dragon, uh, but it's a tavern. <laughs> That's not the right place you want to go to, so you, you finally get where you're supposed to be. The Roman makes a mental note of where it is, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> and uh, you, you get to the door, and as you try to open it, it is actually locked. Did someone send the runner? Yes, yes, you guys did send the runner. I feel like I'd be leading the way. Yeah, the door's locked. Yeah, how would you like to proceed? Uh, knock? Give it a on knock. the door? <laughs> you give it a knock, knock, knock. That door does not open, but from about 25 feet down, a secondary door opens. It's much less obvious, but it's a little more ornate. You're not 100% sure how you missed it until this moment. As you did describe it. Doesn't appear to be a... Shop entrance. Uh, this appears to be an entrance into a house. Does the door just open, like by magical means, or does a person? No, uh, open? A, a man steps out, very much similarly dressed to the shop vendor. For those of you that were there earlier, the same kind of very not fancily dressed, but very well cut clothing. Just a middle aged human male, longer, kind of shaggy brown hair, fairly thick beard and mustache. He's got the whole rock and the whole look. He has a scar that runs from his right temple. Uh, across the bridge of his nose down to his left jaw. And he's 25 feet beneath us? To the right of you. He's closer to the entrance to the alley that you came in. Uh, You guys actually Mm -hmm. passed that door. That's what you guys get for not rolling perception or asking if you can roll perception. (laughs) And he, are you, I believe, the dinner guests that we were expecting? Yes, we are. Dinner? I thought there was dragon scales. (laughs) Yes. And dinner. There's both. Good, good, good. Please, uh, my master awaits you in his dining hall. And he, okay, can we talk about the weather? It's snowing? Yeah, it's cold as fuck, right? He just, it is early spring. These are not uncommon here. Mm. It's not my favorite at the weather, but it's uh, <laughs> worse. He goes, well, it's much warmer inside if you'd like to enter, please. And he pushes the door open and Steps out. Get to the 31 inside. He's been complaining about the cold. And Arome also goes inside. All right. As you guys kind of pile in, the shop was very neat, very orderly, but it was still a shop, you know, just kind of your basic paved floor, shelves lined throughout. This is a horse of another color entirely. Uh, you walk into a marble entryway with massive pillars. This one building here, it doesn't make sense for it to be as big as it is. At first, it takes a second for it to kind of adjust. Like you're pretty confident there might be some type of enlargement spell making it larger. Yeah, seen it before. You're pretty confident that's about what this is with that Arcana check, Artemis. Uh, this is a, some type of distortion of reality spell to so give more room to this area than what they should have. But it, it's a beautiful white marble. It's got uh, silver inlays across it, leading up to a grand dual staircase that goes up on each side, rounded. Beneath that, in the center point, are two large doors that are thrown open, and there's a uh, the, that same marble tile work leads into it with a very large table. Uh, and there appear to be four gentlemen sitting at that table at the far end of it. Just from this distance, you're confident that one of them is the merchant from earlier in the day, but you've not seen the other three before. Icky kind of walks in and is, like, looking around for dragon scales. <laughs> good afternoon. Good to see you all again. Or, yes, good to see you all again. The artist as requested. As you say that again, the, the host is the shopkeeper from earlier. He stands up from the end of the table, and he bows, and he looks at you, and, well... 
it's good to see you. You're here right on... Well, to be honest, uh, we weren't 100% sure the runner said you were on your way presently, but we did not know how soon to expect you, because he was not rather forthcoming with information. But, uh, please, please, welcome, welcome. This is my home. You've seen my shop. Now that you're here, you're my guest once we break bread and have a drink. So please, have anything that you would like. And he kind of points to the table, and as you guys look at it, it is, it's not a full meal. It's uh, pretty much finger foods, horse d'oeuvre, pick the blanket, uh, some caviar uh, crackers, pretty good selection. Tapas. And uh, you guys are uh, welcome to get some of whatever you would like. I will take his invitation and I will get some. Is everybody taking a bite? Yeah. Everybody okay. is. No, I don't trust any of this shit. So I'm, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to check out the food and the drinks very thoroughly. Okay, go ahead and give me a perception roll. Yeah, so anybody who's inspecting the stuff, uh, it appears to be just food. There does not appear to be anything wrong with it. It doesn't taste funny uh, for those of you that have eaten it. It's just really good food. Oh, I eat some. What is the most pungent smelling thing at this table? There appeared to be pickled herring eggs. Yeah. I take one take and then, one no, I take one in my hand and I like shove it slowly into my mouth. All the while I have like a maintaining eye contact with the host to gauge his reaction. And if he doesn't react in any way, I grab another and do the same until he shows any sort of reaction. <laughs> no, he he does not seem to have any response to that at all. I appreciate it. He tried to learn Well, as as the eggs go go further up in numbers, it starts getting quicker and quicker. How many eggs are on this plate? It appeared to be that there were only like fifteen. But even though you keep grabbing eggs, you're confident that you've taken all of them. It is still there. Oh, and I'm not even, like, looking down at the eggs either. I'm trying to, like, maintain eye contact with them the whole time I'm, like, grabbing them. So I, I wouldn't notice this right away until mm. I've partaken in quite a few and start to actually some, get somewhat full that I look down and it's still, like, a full plate. Oh, very confused, but also delighted at this prospect. <laughs> it's finally happening. <laughs> so as you guys kind of make yourself at home, you guys have all broken bread. He looks around and go ahead and give me a 80. You rolled great. That last one, Magdar, you as well. So we'll count this towards your roll of the other guests present. But everybody else, give me a perception check on the three other guests. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. Okay. Oh, gosh. I have not broken eye contact. You're, you're just watching. <laughs> and Roma is just the only one sizing up the guests, I guess. Even with your, your terrible role, because you have not broken eye contact, for just the host, I would like for you to roll another round of perception, please. That's a little better. Okay. Wall kind of cocks his head. He looks at each of them. You guys notice that, uh, so uh, you guys being Wall and and Magdar and AD, and you got a 22 Arame. All of you notice that the other guests all kind of have something oddly familiar about them, and that they all share a very generic resemblance to the host, where he has silver hair and silver eyes, and he's very finely featured as an elf. There is an older gentleman who has the briefest tips of gold at his hair and the rest of it is white with shockingly golden eyes. There is a younger woman who is got just brilliantly copper hair with eyes that almost seem to glow in orange copper color. And with a back to you is a not quite silver, but not quite gray, almost a steel gunmetal color hair and same for the eyes. With a soft smile, your host looks at you and nods and says, What seems that our mutual friend with his penchant for breaking the rules has sent you looking in our direction once more. And he steps back, and the room seems to expand a little bit, and before you is Bahamut. Aha. I spit out some food. Rome is hyperventilating a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> looks down and he goes, 
I see she has left you for her own quest, which I hope the loss was not too much. It's It's been harder, but we know she serves you well. She does. Still hyperventilating. <laughs> <laughs> he smiles, a very unsightly smile. You feel no ill will from him just because this is a 300-foot dragon who is so brilliantly blinding in his perfection that it's hard to tell if he has a color at all. But he slowly transforms back to the version of a moon elf, and he nods. Well met. It was good to see you alive and well. I uh, wipe crumbs off my face. Nice to see you. <laughs> and he, he nods, and he points his head, and he goes, I believe that this ruffian is the one you look for. Jinnabon, I believe, said that you would find him in an outside town, but, you know, why make you go to the work when I can bring the work to you? Oh, we appreciate it. Pretty much. If Rome is, like, resisting the urge to just start bowing, she's like, that would be weird, but Bahamut's in front of me. This is Zoruso, the Bright. He is one of my champions on this plane. He nods to the woman with the copper hair. And he says, this one, for what she is, Hildreth, the Eternal. Watch her, that has most of her kind, she is fond of her jokes. And this one, he nods one last time, is Sergei the Mammoth. And at that, the last dragon at the table turns and looks at you. And not seen in this world for many millennia, a steel dragon. They all maintain their humanoid forms, right? Yes, none of them tran- transform. Okay. Midway through scarfing down an egg, Icky, like, freezes with a half-eaten egg kind of hanging out of his mouth, just kind of staring up at the dragon as, as it turns slowly back into a human. <laughs> it's just, like, frozen there, like, with chewed-up egg kind of falling out of his mouth at this point. With that, he nods, and he goes, Well, I will take my leave. Uh, I've tarried as long as I can, but may this meeting go the way it need. And he just kind of stepped back and space seems to kind of fold in on itself. And he leaves you there with the other three dragons. A few seconds later, a robot remembers how breathing works. <laughs> <laughs> Are we god magnets? <laughs> you would appear so. Where do they all keep coming from? <laughs> at that. The bad thing? Hildreth looks at you and she goes, if not a magnet, at least an annoyer. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, things I was never expecting when they took this job. It's a pleasure to meet you all. She does give a bow, not like a full-on kneeling bow. It's just like a respectful. At the bow, you notice the gold seems to be rather nonplussed with your arrival. He does not really seem to give at all of a damn that you guys are even there in the room. And he... <sighs> Six hundred years I've been here. Six hundred years, nothing's changed. We have limited time left on this world. What do you want? And what do you think you can do to stop what's going to come? There's a lot to unpack there. Icky flips through his notebook to one of the first of the pages after the first little note flip. And he kind of turns it towards him, and in large scrawled letters, circled in red ink, is the words, Kill King. <laughs> Which is actually the first notes that Brock took down in this campaign. Nice! <laughs> 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 and, uh, he, ah, that's brilliant, because no one else has tried that before. If the three of us failed, what makes you mortal think you can succeed? Icky. We don't have a lot to lose, and we figured out some of the things that give him power. I mean, they underestimated us once. <laughs> True. We should be at Hiller right now, but we're not. At that, Siri, uh, the steel dragon, looks back at you for the first time, and you notice one of the eyes is missing, and he looks at you with the good one. After all we did, they came back. There's half a dragon. You think a group of misfits and losers can actually kill the king? Yes. Trying to scrutiny me from a half a dragon? No, I'm not. Ignore no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not going to say that's a bad idea. I'm just going to say as 
a DM, I wouldn't recommend that be the way you want this to go. That, that, that was that was from Crash. That was bad. <laughs> Seeing as at a glance, he has a plus seventeen to hit. Jesus. Hey, <laughs> <And> Crash. <laughs> We've cleansed two of the star stones. Yeah, I was gonna say as soon as Artemis starts saying that, Icky will fish in his bag and he'll plunk down loudly on the table the depleted shards. Perhaps with some help, we get to find a way. As you set the first one down, you notice that the second one has gone dark as well. Yeah. So. What in the world? At this time, you see that that more than anything else that you've done. You're not 100% sure if he's mad with you or just what's happened. Much like Jinnabon was just incensed at the desecration of this, what he treated as almost a holy object. The golden dragon squints his eyes and his hair briefly turns solid gold. You see the very beginnings of wings start to open up on his from his cloak. Uh, he gets slightly larger. He takes a breath and he steadies himself. What do you need from us? We need to know the way to the key. Yes, we were told of a key. We still have six more of these that we know of to collect. He shook his head. He goes, if two have been drained, all have been drained. If he has sent you for the key, we will only be here for months instead of years. There's some under comments wearing going on. He takes a breath and kind of steadies himself. The key you seek is the key to all magic of this world of this plane you could call it we come from a place not of this life not of one anyone from your planet has seen save for that miserable hobgoblin and as he says that Ah. uh, Hilgriff just because you don't like him he just glares at her for a moment and goes back he is the only one not of our kind from your world to successfully navigate the multiverse to any extent. The king has had his hand in it, but at least in that, the gods can have more free sway to direct those who are not worthy of it. It takes a special individual to piss off not only the just, but the evil deities as well. If there was ever a time for that bitch and our god to get along, it was with him. You guys can read that bitch as Tiamat. Okay. <laughs> okay. And he kind of steadies himself. The key to this world's magic source is held in a cavern that is not so much surrounded as made of anti-magic. The dragons cannot go. We are beings of this. And if we were to enter, we would die almost instantly. I'd nudge Magdar with my elbow. (laughs) (laughs) He uh, looks at you and he goes, We know how to get there, but not where it is. That is the magic of it. It is a one-way ticket, as far as we know. No one has ever come back. No one has ever returned. And when the gods created this, they did it, seeing that there was only so many ways this world would end with the king finally coalescing into what he is almost at, what Jinnabon became, and part of the Pantheon, or with his death and the potential death of this world. That is where you must go. Oh, is that all? Robe's looking around for something to drink. <laughs> <laughs> there is plenty on the table to be, to be drunk in it. I am drinking. She's not trying to get completely hammered, but she's like... <laughs> So, the only way for this world to not be destroyed is for the king to become a god. If we destroy the king, we destroy the world? That is the thought. Wait a minute, I thought it was save the cheerleader, save the world. (laughs) (laughs) And as he says that, the steel dragon kind of steps up and he steps away from the table and he looks back at the gold. You've always been partial to this thought. There is another. Kill the king. Stop the god. Save the world. Honestly, do you want him as a god? 
we finally get a little bit on our side with the small one and his friends. But it'll take decades. And then you throw him in the mix. It will offset the power again. Honestly, I don't think my gods would like it. And they're more about guidelines than, (laughs) you know, fate and rules. I'm curious to see what you're suggesting. I would rather not have the world end, or is there are some few I care about? The world will end today, tomorrow, in 3,000 years, and 3 billion years. Everything ends. It's the story of why that is important. Is it worth it at the end of the day? Destroying evil for the sake of destroying it at the cost of all of the life? That is the question you must ask. Do you take the risk to let him become what he has so long sought? Or do you take the risk to stop it and snuff out all life on the planet? Or maybe get lucky and save the world from what we think will happen. So you're saying there's a chance. Small, but yes, he is chance. All right, well. I mean, if we end the world, then it's not really our problem anymore. We become the bad guys? We, Who was a bad guy when everyone's dead? The people that killed them. Think back. There was world once. Where great heroes when die. They did not die. They merely extended their fight on for eternity against the horde. Would that not be life for one like you? To die, yet never die, fight forever, until victorious. That was to Magnar, right? Yep, that was to Magnar. Okay. Oh. I guess in part that would be to Wall, because I, I I feel like he would be able to pick up that from Wall as well. Uh, I mean, yeah, that, that, that sounds great. Then, the decision is yours. Take the night, think. We do not go to the towers, precaution. They have ways of instantaneous shape refiguring. And um, the last time a dragon went in, we took out two stories. We try to stay away now. Also, those fey teleporting bastards. We don't like them. I hear that. Duh. Fey hmm. contracts. Have you tried the slide? You mean out? Yes, yes. It was, was once my idea. Actually, I stole from her, but she did not act quick enough. I like the invisible slide. Do you have any suggestions for... Things we could look into to give ourselves a better chance of not destroying the world and then never to save it. At that, the copper dragon looks at you and kind of... You're asking us to expand upon lore and legend from when we were born. If it was a legend for us, it doesn't exist for you. There's nothing there. The gold at this point has completely silent. He appears to want nothing to do with this conversation anymore. Remind me again, so we've got a gold, a steel, and what was the other color? Copper, Copper. okay. Uh If there is no chance, why would Bahamut expedite this meeting? If there is truly no hope and no way. And at, at that, the gold dragon just kind of sniffs and gets up and he exits the room. And the copper dragon takes a step towards him, but the steel dragon just kind of grabs her arm and stops her for a moment. And Siri looks at the group and he there is a chance, not large. We do not, as dragons, intrinsically trust fate or fortune. We make our own. It is our way. We have lived, the three of us, together for countless millennia. And yet this power-hungry leech took my eye and his will to fight. The only one who came out mostly unscathed was this one. She's slightly crazier than she was. And she kind of sticks her tongue out at him and she looks at the group and it is not that we don't want to help. It is that we are already beaten. If there is one thing all dragons have an abundance of, it is pride. And to see mortals do what we failed to do or even attempt Hoots his soul, and she nods towards the door where the golden dragon walked out of. He will come around, but do not take 
the slim chance you were being offered as anything more than that. A butterfly flapping its wings may not cause the tsunami, but the hawk diving on the sparrow will almost always get its meal. That is what he worries of. If our fate is so bleak, what's the harm in trying? This is why we like the more. You see no problem in taking a risk. We've already had DB in death twice. We also have a little bit less stake. Oh, Jesus Christ, what are you trying to steal? <laughs> this entire conversation, I've been trying to, anytime someone looks away from Icky, shove pickled herring, or pickled eggs in my uh, a bag of holding. I will say, give me a D100 <laughs> and divide it by two. And that is how many eggs you've been able to shove into your bag of holding. Hell yeah. So you've got 40 pickled herring eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Those will all age well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's fine in the bag of holding. We will see you tomorrow. Let's make it that... Oh, let's just meet together. Make my life easier. This is my home. Even though I have loaned it out temporarily. It was a pleasure meeting you. He nods. I was told there'd be dragon scales. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like the little one. He is to the point. What was the agreed upon price for my wares? He looks to Vicaros. If I remember, it was 2400 for nine mm-hmm. white dragon scales. If I remember correctly, it was 2000 and they laugh. Uh, well, oh. <laughs> well done. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he reaches behind his back and pulls out a large sack and tosses it. Where is it going to land? He just kind of throws it towards you. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> the, the sack is is rather large. Yeah. Uh, and so he's, he's not like aiming at you. He's like putting it kind of like between you and Wall. I was going to say, I feel like Wall would probably see that this is going to end poorly and try and interpose. <laughs> yeah, no. Like I said, it, it's like in your direction. It's not, he's not trying to hit you with it. He's just getting it next to you. <laughs> and uh, he leave the money with my man. He will make sure it gets to the registers. And he puts his arm around the waist of the copper dragon, and they walk out the uh, door, uh, the side door, uh, and leave the dining room. I would take them out of the sack they're in and shove them one by one into my bag. Okay, (laughs) you do so. (laughs) Just giggling maniacally as the whole time. Oh, this just got more complicated. Yes, certainly did. I actually just learned so much, you guys, about this whole situation. Oh yeah, we did. Ne- we never did explain to you what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just got the rundown. I got the. Uh... We're tired a while ago. Got our asses kicked, it, and somehow we're redirected. We weren't sent to hell. Now we're trying again, and that just happened. She gestures to where the dragons had been standing. So are we just standing in this dude's house now. As you guys kind of take a look around, you notice that his manservant has kind of walked in, and he just kind of, <clears throat> this way. Thank you. Sorry. And as you guys go to leave, he puts a hand out, and he goes, I do believe payment is in order. Ah, yes, yes. I think of a large amount of gold, nothing specific, and just kind of overturn the bag of holding. That looks about right, yeah? He looks at it, and he... If there is more needed, we know where to find you. It's actually probably going to be more than what's actually needed. Yeah, and, and he, he kind of, he stops and he thinks, and if there's any left over, we will send it to you. He, like, doesn't really care about the gold at all at this point. He's just, like, giggling the fact that he's got the, the dragon scales he wants. And he's, like, in a hurry to get back to his room. We'll call it as uh, 2290, but they will okay. refund you the uh, 290. They are lawful good dragons by the, at the end of the day, so... All right. <laughs> I think Rama is just, like, as we're walking, you can tell she's not entirely there. Like, she's just stuck on the fact that the world could end. Just what these snakes are. And the fact that they definitely will not be surviving this encounter unless they get really lucky. So, as soon as we exit onto the street, Icky's going to jump up on Wall's shoulder and he's just going to be like whispering in his ear and you hear like every once in a while kind of a giggle kind of rise out of him. 
even Wall's kind of, you see, he's he's kind of excited about what Icky's whispering to him. Awesome. Artemis is happy that he has something new to uh, research. Yeah, Artemis just kind of breaking much off. And that it may be pertinent soon. That may be pertinent to the uh, the weave of the magic. <laughs> well, yes, the source of magic here. There's a multiverse. I could learn how to travel it. Yeah, this is <laughs> a very good conversation for you, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm torn between, does Rome want to go get drunk, or does she want to go lock herself in one of those prayer rooms for a couple of hours, because that's a lot. <laughs> as you guys are shuffling out the door, the weather has kind of stopped. It's not as cold as it was, but there's a, there's a good bit of snow on the ground. It's very, very quiet, and it's not quite full dark. You guys got there probably about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You were only in there for about an hour, so it's probably about 5, 5.30. But you guys kind of start to head back. Go ahead and everybody give me a round of perception. That's about right for how distracted she is right now. <laughs> uh, before we get too far into this, we can end here and pick up. God, his uh, perception is godly. Right. It's just <laughs> stupid. So everybody who rolled higher than a 15, which is most of the party. Everyone makes distracted. Notice that there is the same group of children as this morning, as well as a couple of adults that seem to be kind of mingled in with them. Heart count for everybody over 15, it looks like there's about seven of them in a group that are now following. They don't even appear to be trying to hide it anymore. They're just watching you where you go. Right. Mm hmm. It's like some children of the corn shit. You guys have gotten uh, like to the mouth of the alley. You're kind of walking back down to the entrance down here. Uh, that's how you guys know how to get there. As you guys get to about here, so a couple of blocks out, you notice that you've not really seen anyone but that group for a few minutes of walking. And as you take this corner here, uh, as you get right into the that roadway, another group of seven people block your path. Thank you for joining us and stay tuned next week to find out what happens on Disciples of the Eight. If you don't want to wait, you can get early access to our episodes over at patreon.com slash pseudonymsocial. If you like our show, please consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcasting app so people can know where to find us. We couldn't do this without your help. Disciples of the Age is a production of Pseudonym Social, changing reality one story at a time. It is deemed by the amazing Bob Tedwell and produced by me, Brianna Toyber, with music by Patrick Chester of Chester Studios. We have Brock as Icky... Ryan as Wall, Matt as Vikros, Spencer as Artemis, Cash as Magdar, Kara as the Anonymous Druid, and myself as Arome. To get more information on this or any of our other shows, check out our website at pseudonymsocial.wordpress.com. <laughs>